Origen's new method of explaining and illustrating religious truths by means of philosophy required also a new method of expounding the sacred scriptures. For, meeting with many things in the scriptures repugnant to the decisions of his philosophy, he deemed it necessary to devise some method of removing this disagreement. And as it would add confirmation to his opinions, if he could make it appear that they were supported by the authority of Scripture, some plausible way was to be devised which should make his speculations appear to be taught in the holy oracles. Therefore, taking up the ancient doctrine of the Pharisees and Essenes, which also he had learned from his preceptor, Clement, namely, that of a double sense in Holy Scripture, he amplified and adorned it so ingeniously that it afforded him ample means of bending the sense of Scripture to suit his purpose and eliminating from the Bible whatever was repugnant to his favorite opinions. How came it, I ask, that Origen, by searching for mystical senses of Scripture, incurred odium in an age when all the Christian doctors, either wholly overlooking or but slightly regarding the literal sense, fondly pursued allegories? Beyond a doubt it must have arisen from this that Origen introduced many innovations into this mode of interpretation and gave new and unheard of rules concerning it. Certainly, he would have had no enemies if he had merely affirmed what no one then called into question, that in addition to the sense which the words of Scripture convey, another sense latent in the things described is to be diligently sought for. This will be manifest if we consider who were the men that inveighed so bitterly against Origen's allegories after he was dead. I refer to Eustatius, Epiphanius, Jerome, Augustine, and many others. All these were themselves allegorous, if I may use that term, and would undoubtedly have condemned any man as a great errorist who should have dared to impugn the arcane sense of Scripture or to censure the deriving both doctrines and precepts and the knowledge of future events from the narratives and laws contained in the Bible. There must, therefore, necessarily have been something new and unusual in Origen's exegetics, which appeared to them pernicious and very dangerous. Otherwise, they would have regarded his system of interpretation as beautiful and perfectly correct. He pronounced a great part of the sacred books to be void of meaning if taken literally, and that only the things indicated by the words were the signs and emblems of higher objects. The Christians who had previously followed after mystic interpretations let the truth of the sacred narratives in the proper sense of the divine laws and precepts remain in full force but he turned much of the sacred history into moral fables and no small part of the divine precepts into mere allegories. Among Christians, there were none before Origen who adopted the opinion that many parts of the scriptures were destitute of any literal meaning. And hence it was 
that when Origen ventured boldly to assert this doctrine, very many resisted it, and very justly feared that the truth and authority of religion itself would be much endangered if the people were told that many things narrated in the Bible never took place, and that many things were commanded which must be understood far otherwise than the words indicated. And it appears strange that a man of so much discernment should not see that those very heretics, the Gnostics, for instance, whom he sought to confute by this mode of interpretation, might very conveniently use it for overthrowing the entire history of the life and death of Christ, the truth of which they denied. But I suspect that Origen became accustomed to this bold exegesis in the same school in which he learned philosophy. For those well informed on the subject know that all the disciples of Ammonius interpreted Homer, Hesiod, and the entire history of the pagan deities in the very same manner in which Origen taught his followers to interpret a large part of the Bible. He induced the expositors of Scripture to think little about the literal sense of passages and to run enthusiastically after the sublimer interpretations. It was very different with the other Christian doctors who possess good sense. Although they highly valued the mystical sense, yet they placed an equal value on the grammatical and historical. Nay, they made the latter the foundation and basis of the former, whence it would follow that no inquiry after the arcane and moral sense should be made until the literal meaning is carefully and accurately ascertained. Origen sought to derive from the scriptures by means of allegories that philosophy which he had embraced and that he believed the philosophical grounds of the Christian doctrines were exhibited, though somewhat obscurely, by the sacred writers. Those who, up to that time, had sought for allegories in the scriptures had found there only religious or sacred allegories, such as referred to Christ, to Antichrist, to the state of the church, and to the duties of Christians. But Origen, following the example of Philo, Judaeus, whom he was taught by his master, Clement, to follow as a guide, endeavored to make a large part of the Bible teach the dogmas of the philosophers. Now, as all the opinions we have mentioned were displeasing to most Christian teachers, so the rules of interpretation introduced by Origen to advance them could not but displease many and be rejected not only as novel, but also as injurious to the scriptures and to their author. As to the causes which induced Origen to amplify and to systematize the allegoric mode of interpreting scripture, it must be admitted in the first place that much was due to the excessively fecund genius of the man, to the customary practice among the Egyptians, to his education, to the instruction of his preceptors, and to the example both of the philosophers whom he admired and of the Jews, especially Philo. But in addition to these external and natural causes, as they may be called, there were others originating from his own deliberate judgment, and among the latter some were not dishonorable 
or unworthy of a religious teacher desirous of advancing the cause of Christianity. First, he hoped that the Jews would more readily be persuaded to embrace Christianity if certain portions of the Old Testament were explained mystically and allegorically, for he supposed certain prophecies which, if construed literally, would not refer to Christ, were an obstacle to the Jews embracing Christ. But that if these prophecies were explained mystically and no regard paid to the literal sense, the Jews might be more ready to believe that all the ancient prophets foretold concerning the Messiah actually referred to Jesus of Nazareth. Secondly, he supposed that the class of heretics called Gnostics, the Basilidians, the Valentinians, and others could not be completely put down and confuted except by the admission of allegories in the Old Testament. For these sects, in order to prove that the Supreme God, the Father of our Savior, was a different being from him who created this world and caused the Old Testament to be written, cited many passages from the Mosaic laws, from the writings of the prophets, and from the historical books of the Old Testament, which they considered as unworthy of the majesty and holiness of the Supreme God, and as indicative of a degree of weakness and wickedness. And as Origen despaired of solving these objections, he thought they must be avoided by resorting to allegories and that all the passages with which the Gnostics reproached God and his friends and ministers must be construed in a mystical sense worthy of the divine character. These two reasons Origen himself repeatedly mentions, and especially in his book, De Principis. Got some good stuff to talk about. I got a little bit of feedback from some viewers, too, to talk about a bit. So, I think I also saw that you broke 100 subscribers. Yeah. It's at like 106. Not, ooh, that's quite a few. That's a good seven, eight people. Yeah. Yeah. And that last video has 399 views last I checked. Oh, nice. So that's pretty good. People have to watch that rapture video perhaps a couple times before they realize what they have there. Because... Uh, when you realize the urgency with which Paul was teaching this idea and then correcting them about it, it shows how important it was and that they thought the completion of their mission was at hand, you know? Mm -hmm. And so they were ready for things that happen. They were ready to get caught up and meet the Lord as the day of the Lord unfolded, and then they would usher him in to save Israel and to judge wicked Israel and restrict them out of the kingdom, but to save the nation from the Roman power and bring in the kingdom era. Only if they could bring in the fullness of the Gentiles. So, 
and cause all Israel to believe. So, but see, he thought they were going to be accomplishing that. And so he was urgently teaching that. And it is the rapture of the church, and it's a resurrection event. So the living don't precede the dead in any sense. It's a resurrection event for the church. In fact, the dead are raised. Then we're changed and caught up with them together. So they're raised, and then we're changed, and the group is caught up in the air. But it's... In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, like he says in 1 Corinthians 15, but in it's the same event in 1 Thessalonians that he's talking about in 2 Thessalonians. And in 2 Thessalonians 2, the language in verse 1 is real clear that it's about the coming of the Lord and are gathering to him, synagoguing to him. It is this same event that he talked to them about before. So, he was teaching it with urgency. It was an important issue and everything. But uh, people that are post-millennialists uh, they wouldn't see any reason to even talk about the return of the Lord not with urgency it would be a, it, at least a thousand years off I'll get into post-millennialism but there's no reason for Paul to have much to say on the return of the Lord like you know and uh and then when you get into preterism, they'll try to make this about AD 70 and a coming in judgment, but it's about the resurrection of the church. So, it's interesting. But, uh, yeah, that video might not strike people at first what they have, but when you understand First and Second Thessalonians, there's the rapture right in front of your face. It's an event that was mistaken to be just for living believers. That's not right. That's a mistake. And that means it's not the resurrection at the last day he was talking about when he was with them. It's a special event, meeting Messiah the sons of light, like he mentions in 1 Thessalonians 5. And that's that old Jewish idea about meeting Messiah and ushering him in. And then in uh, 2 Thessalonians, then you find out that as this special event occurs, it is in such a way that the church is kept from the day of the Lord. And that's the real pre-tribulational idea right there. Now, I think when Paul was teaching to the churches, he had an optimistic view, which is a no-tribulational view. It's not pre-tribulational, it's no tribulation. If they could accomplish their mission and usher in the age, then there wouldn't be a 70th week for the nation. And the kingdom would be hastened in, like Isaiah 60, 22 mentions as a possibility. Yeah, so... Uh, So you take those two letters together then and uh, you can see Paul was talking about a special event that's a resurrection event for the church and it's before the day of the Lord. But like I was saying, as I was saying, I think 
Paul was initially teaching an optimistic view, which is a no tribulational view. But he does give a pessimistic outlook in Second Thessalonians 2. That's where you see a pessimistic outlook. And, and he describes the events in the 70th week. This man of sin is obviously the little horn of Daniel 7. Daniel 7.25. That's the guy. So my view isn't quite the classic dispensational view, but it's close. So that's the thing, like uh, in 1 Thessalonians 4, when Paul says, at the coming of the Lord, we'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And um, post-tribulationists point out that uh, it seems unusual to insert seven years in there, like seven years elapse between the meeting the Lord and coming back. That's a long time. And uh, But that's only if uh, Paul, when he was speaking in First Thessalonians 4, if he had a great tribulation for Israel in view as he was speaking. Do you see what I mean? What if yeah, he, yeah. you do see that? Good. Because mm -hmm. like, what if he was just thinking, you know, meet the Lord in the air and not sure I'm in. And uh, so there's some uh, things that the classic view might, I don't know, strain with a little, whereas my view doesn't. And there's other ones, you know, it's like my view, I would say, puts the apocalypse together all the way. My view explains the Olivet Discourse all the way, and etc. So I got that going for me, which is nice. So uh, the, the rapture issue may be another area like that, I don't know. Um, but the typical dispensational exposition is just fine. And you have to keep in mind that when Paul was writing this to the Thessalonians, both of these letters, especially the second one, the first one, seems it seems he was just correcting their own misunderstanding. Then in the second letter he wrote to him, he had been made aware that they received a false message as if from the apostles. And so he describes the event in a cryptic sort of way that they would recognize and remember from when he was with them. That's very important to understand there. That's why he describes this event in a strange way in Second Thessalonians 2. That's real important. Uh, Chrysostom gives the opinion that he must have been referring to the Roman Empire, and he describes it cryptically to keep everyone safe so as not to raise Roman uh, persecution against the church. It's an interesting theory from Chrysostom. And uh, you can find this idea really in other earlier works like the Epistle of Barnabas, chapter 4, and some other places. The idea, Lane, is basically these early guys were living in the Roman Empire, the legs of iron, right? And they thought that the Roman Empire would have to go through some kind of issue, uh, restructuring into the feet of mixed iron and clay with ten toes and so forth. They thought the Roman Empire would have to undergo this transition. Maybe then the men 
of sin would emerge. That's what John Chrysostom's indicating. And it's an interesting idea for his time. But since then, the Roman Empire has dissolved and vanished. And things haven't been fulfilled. So, so I guess my point is that uh, his view is interesting and everything, but it's just wrong. If if you read the letter, Second Thessalonians, if you read the letter itself, you can tell why Paul's speaking cryptically. It's because they had been misled by a message as if from the apostles, and perhaps even a letter. So, so that's all things that people need to think on, and they need to consider that Paul was only in Thessalonica about a month, and yet this was part of his teaching. See, what that means, Lane, is that in the early churches, they were getting people to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, that God had raised him. He was the Messiah. He's ascended, but he'll return just as soon as the fullness of the Gentiles are brought in and all Israel is saved. They all believe. That was the goal. Mm -hmm. And that was the teaching in the early churches. And that simple goal and theology isn't what's in churchendom. Right. Yeah. Right, right, right. They're all still trying to fulfill the Great Commission even now. See that? Yeah, oh, definitely. And they don't have the spirit. The, th the window of opportunity for this was when the church had the spirit. That's when the window was open, and we didn't accomplish it. And I think the apostasy that the apostles were warning about is this time when Jews turned from any belief that God raised Jesus and joined Bar Kokhba in the Bar Kokhba revolt. And that coincides somewhat with the spirit ceasing and fading out. So the church ends in a failed mission and now this man ascend will emerge, I guess. That's the next thing that will happen. So the letters to the churches in the apocalypse that was written before Bar Kokhba, that was a final call to holy living and witnessing to hasten in the era, but we didn't accomplish it, and the spirit ceased. So what remains in the apocalypse after the letters to the churches, that whole remaining period there, that has to be fulfilled now, and it includes a 70th week. That's how I think it's all playing out. You want the truth? You can't handle the truth! And that makes the best sense of the structure of the apocalypse. Here's something else, Lane. That's why the term saints is used once again of the Israelites in chapters 5 and onward in the apocalypse. It's not used of the churches in the letters to the churches. So when John was writing the apocalypse, it's already kind of foreseen the failure of the church and then the nation in the tribulation will once again have this designation of the holy ones, the elect, the entity to bring it in. So I think my view makes the best sense of the apocalypse and all kinds of other things. Olivet Discourse, a lot of different passages. First and second Thessalonians, I would say. 
I would agree. Well, thanks. I'm still reading through the New Testament a lot and thinking about it. I'm going to read through Ephesians and Colossians over and over and keep thinking about it. So, it's a lot of fun. This is how you make the Bible fun. Yeah. You figure out what it really means, and it's simpler. It's simpler, and it's awesome. So. <clears throat> you might have touched on this, but what I also like about your view is you have an explanation to why Paul talks about the day of the Lord and uh, and other authors too, Peter and James. They're very hopeful about this coming of the Lord that we overlook now that we're 2,000 years in the future. They yeah. they really were so hopeful of the coming of the Lord and the return of the Lord. And the early, I would assume the early church was that way. And that really the current covenantal view just really loses luster quick of like, well, the, the coming of the Lord can be any day now, but it's, it, there's, there's a greater significance when your view is in mind for this. Like yeah. they're really hopeful at that time of that coming of the Lord. And this is why we need to live these holy lives. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense of that a lot. As for, Covenantalists, um, I don't think they think much about the coming of the Lord. I just don't think it's on their minds. And, I think the great, uh, I think the Great Commission is really what's on their minds. Yeah. Not recognizing that it, it's it's paused or ceased yeah. for the time being, and that, but that's really their focus. And really, Lane, with uh, I'll have to get into more millennial history and stuff, but with post-millennialism where you think, see, the the old, the old-fashioned amillennial view just thought that the thousand years and Christ's reign are synonymous terms the the church it's the church it's a church age it's all synonymous it's the time between the advents so the whole time between the first advent and the second advent is just the kingdom the church the thousand years it's all the same it's just it's a spiritual kingdom well that view um it's unsatisfying for different reasons. And I'll get into that when we get into the millennial history. But as a person that believes in a spiritual kingdom develops their view more, they are pretty much, they're going to end up entertaining this post-millennial idea. And it's the idea that really... The thousand years is a part of Christ's reign. It's the final part. It's the final glorious concluding time of Christ's overall reign. So they think Christ's reign began at the first advent, but not the thousand years. And they think that there will be a mass conversion to Christianity around the globe to bring in a glorious period to conclude the kingdom. And that'll be the thousand years. Um, there's reasons that a millennialism pretty much needs to be adjusted this way. And um, they can't think the return of the Lord is near. It has to be at least a thousand years away, see? And mm -hmm. what, what they're looking to accomplish right now is this Christianizing of the earth mm -hmm. with the Great Commission. Man, 
it's this is a watershed issue when you realize that in the times before origin the christians were killius who thought that the brief little great tribulation period could bust on the scene at any time and they would suffer through it and then the lord would come and this glorious kingdom age would begin so they were futurist and premillennial that's what they believed and then their opponents the gnostics now greeks and a lot of the jewish population at the time entertained greek philosophy and gnosticism is actually a philosophical system that predates the first century uh, it's a greek system of thought and but once the events of Christianity occurred, the resurrection, ascension of Christ, outpouring of the Spirit, the churches are, the, the apostles are planning churches and teaching. Well, some of the population just already kind of held this Greek philosophical worldview. And they were embracing Christianity, but they weren't quite discarding uh, contrary Greek philosophy. And then, so you ended up having people with some blurred ideas and some confusion. And really, you had a lot of people that Gnosticism is the type of philosophy that can absorb ideas around it and bring it into its own system. It can reinterpret things and just pretty much absorb concepts into its own wider system of thought. And so Greek Gnostics were absorbing Christian concepts and teachings into their higher philosophical views. And when they were doing that, they were emptying out the original meanings of things. And so by the second century, you had Orthodox Christians, but then you had these Christian-speaking Gnostics, Gnostics who believed in Jesus the Christ, but he was different. He had been changed. Like, for example, he wasn't a true man, and he was like a ghostly manifestation and stuff you had some of these different ideas being presented but that's why in this real early time you had an orthodox christianity doing battle against this false christianity it's really crazy looking to read justin irenaeus tertullian hippolytus and to see them debating against a fully developed false version of things. It's scary, really, when you think about it, that a false version of things could emerge like that. And the Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's it's scary, you know, it's and the apostles warned about it, they knew of the Greek philosophical atmosphere in which everyone in the world was living post-Alexander and um, they warned keep that which is committed to thy trust avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called in the King James science falsely so called it's gnosis And beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Philosophy or vain deceit. There's a few statements scattered in some of the apostolic letters where 
they knew that a Greek mindset could damage the original teaching, see? And they were warned against it. They must have seen this to some extent, even in their time. But you have a full-blown opposing view pretty early. And so what's interesting, though, is uh, in this early time, Justin and Irenaeus used their premillennial doctrine as a litmus test, a method for discerning the Gnostics in their midst or laity that had been misled by Gnostic teaching. They actually used their premillennialism to determine who was either a Gnostic straight up or they'd been influenced by it. So that was the situation in the earliest church, though. When I was talking to you before, and we talked about the delay in the coming of the Lord, uh, the ceasing of the Spirit, mm -hmm. there were other things going on. Um, the church was becoming highly Greek. There were not many Jewish converts, especially after the Bar Kokhba period, Jewish converts to the faith dropped off. Greek membership kept growing, and the Christian church became highly Greek. And this is another part of the reason the thinking drifted in a Greek direction away from the original Jewish thinking. Mm. And there's other contributing factors as well. Um, but it it's not... Uh, how can I put this? You don't just give up on something. You don't just quit believing. Dick Rickle, who is uh, having a cigarette. You know, he has a cigarette lighter in the car. Just... Right. Well, when it cut me off, I was saying that uh, <clears throat> the early church was going through some issues, but holding the faith. Then this fella came along, Origen who was already uh, a Greek Christian. And he developed a method of interpreting scripture that would allow some of these Greek notions to seemingly be present in scripture. And he was a genius. He was a genius. And here's why. He was going to kill three birds with one stone. There was a problem. The Jews were saying, well, we don't believe in your Jesus because he didn't bring in the kingdom. So he's not the Christ. That's a problem. Then he had another problem. The Gnostics were saying, you Christians ignore the higher allegorical meaning of this text, and you end up with a, a dumb little uh, low, lowly, earthly, materialistic idea from our Greek perspective anyways. So you had the Gnostics raising that problem. 
And the third problem is this Jewish movement in a world of Greek philosophy. The world had bigger ideas than this Jewish movement seemed to be capable of. And Origen wanted to take Christianity into the big time and make it a full philosophy that could compete with the big boys in the Greek world. He killed these three birds with one stone in his method of expositing scripture. And he, this makes him a genius. And he saved Christianity. If you look at it a certain way, he reinvented the faith and pushed it in a direction that made it explode and become a big, a big deal. He's highly responsible for that. And he was seen as a hero in his time. For example, Eusebius, the church historian, and he was a bishop of a church and so forth, but he's known for his church history. And he was a big fan of Origen, and everyone was. Origen was a hero type leader in the church in his time and for a little time afterwards. But then he would fall into disrepute not too long afterwards. But anyway, so that, that is what happened and discarding the resurrection to reign with Christ in a kingdom on earth, that was part of Origen's bigger movement he, he began. But what was this method of exposition that he came up with? Well, it needs to be explained right because there's nothing wrong with seeing allegory in scripture. I see allegory all over the place in scripture. It's, it's to be found in a lot of places. And I have even talked about the grand allegory in Genesis 3. And um, so I definitely see allegory in scripture, but not the way Origen saw it. He had a different way of doing things. And the best way to explain it is to let Mashim explain it. So let me quote some from him. Because here's what people need to understand. Anyone before, you... What? I'm, so, I'm sorry, real quick. Before you get started, would this be found on the Internet Archive? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Very good. And I'll link it below. I will put the link to this below the video. Sounds good. Well, and as I, you were saying... I always try to do that. I've noticed that in your videos. You do a good job citing your sources because, uh, well, just like you and I, anybody can study this. just a matter of the time and the thought put in to do so. The resources are out there. Yeah, they're all but, right there, and they're free. Oh, yeah. What I was going to say, though, is this is real important to understand because before Origen did what he did, there weren't any Orthodox Christians believing in a mystical resurrection and kingdom. That was a marking point of Gnostic apostasy. Gnostic apostate teaching. Well, apostate means to depart from something. It was Gnostic perversion. And 
before Origin's time, there are not any Orthodox non kilius There were some laity that had been misled on this issue. And I'll quote them probably in a future video. I'll quote some early fathers to show what I'm talking about. But um, before Origin's time, Christians believed in the resurrection of the just and the kingdom of God on earth. And they used this as a litmus test to detect Gnostics in their midst. And I'll prove that in a future video. But, um, so what's so important about this lane, it's essential to understand when you hear someone today that believes in a mystical kingdom view and a millennial view or a post millennial view, which is really just a highly developed and thought out a millennial view. It's a revised a millennial view. Mystical kingdom, those two views, people today holding them will be utilizing Origen's method of exposition in order to embrace that doctrine of the kingdom that they hold. What did he just say? Did, did he did he say that the allegorical elements of Origen's um, theology, which of course I've exposed and taught against for decades, that was developed against the concept of the millennium? They will be using Origen's method for their doctrine on the kingdom. And that's important for people to understand. And people that teach the mystical kingdom today don't want you to know about that. And, but it is the truth. This method of exposition is not the historical grammatical method. Biblical hermeneutics, number one, grammatical historical exegesis. It's a weird method designed to twist scripture. And it's used today to produce the spirit kingdom doctrine and some other heresies that are very prevalent in churchendom today. And I really think that especially once you have origin come along in church history, you get the idea of the early uh, churches embracing of an allegorical interpretation and hence the the diminishment of the literal meaning of the words uh, and looking for only a spiritual meaning and things like that. Origin's method of exposition is what James White uses to arrive at his post-millennialism. A lot of these reformed churches never reformed much, just their soteriology. And so they still hold some of these old Roman Catholic views or they hold a more sophisticated post-millennialism. That's nice, but it's still this, it's this mystical kingdom stuff and it needs Origen's method. And you'll see why when I quote from Mashim here. Origen's new method of explaining and illustrating religious truths by means of philosophy required also a new method of expounding the sacred scriptures. For, meeting with many things in the scriptures repugnant to the decisions of his philosophy, 
he deemed it necessary to devise some method of removing this disagreement. And as it would add confirmation to his opinions, if he could make it appear that they were supported by the authority of Scripture, some plausible way was to be devised which should make his speculations appear to be taught in the holy oracles. Therefore, taking up the ancient doctrine of the Pharisees and Essenes, which also he had learned from his preceptor, Clement, namely, that of a double sense in Holy Scripture, he amplified and adorned it so ingeniously that it afforded him ample means of bending the sense of Scripture to suit his purpose and eliminating from the Bible whatever was repugnant to his favorite opinions. How came it, I ask, that Origen, by searching for mystical senses of Scripture, incurred odium in an age when all the Christian doctors, either wholly overlooking or but slightly regarding the literal sense, fondly pursued allegories. Beyond a doubt it must have arisen from this, that Origen introduced many innovations into this mode of interpretation and gave new and unheard of rules concerning it. Certainly, he would have had no enemies if he had merely affirmed what no one then called into question, that in addition to the sense which the words of Scripture convey, another sense latent in the things described is to be diligently sought for. This will be manifest if we consider who were the men that inveighed so bitterly against Origen's allegories after he was dead. I refer to Eustatius, Epiphanius, Jerome, Augustine, and many others. All these were themselves allegorous, if I may use that term, and would undoubtedly have condemned any man as a great errorist who should have dared to impugn the arcane sense of Scripture or to censure the deriving both doctrines and precepts and the knowledge of future events from the narratives and laws contained in the Bible. There must, therefore, necessarily have been something new and unusual in Origen's exegetics which appeared to them pernicious and very dangerous. Otherwise, they would have regarded his system of interpretation as beautiful and perfectly correct. I like this quote line because it's like I said, um, seeing allegory was nothing new. That's not what Origen did that was new. It, was, it went beyond that. So, so Mashim's winding up for that. And, uh, okay. He pronounced a great part of the sacred books to be void of meaning if taken literally, and that only the things indicated by the words were the signs and emblems of higher objects. The Christians who had previously followed after mystic interpretations let the truth of the sacred narratives in the proper sense of the divine laws and precepts remain in full force but he turned much of the sacred history into moral fables and no small part of the divine precepts into mere allegories. Among Christians, there were none before Origen 
who adopted the opinion that many parts of the scriptures were destitute of any literal meaning. And hence it was that when Origen ventured boldly to assert this doctrine, very many resisted it and very justly feared that the truth and authority of religion itself would be much endangered if the people were told that many things narrated in the Bible never took place and that many things were commanded which must be understood far otherwise than the words indicated. And it appears strange that a man of so much discernment should not see that those very heretics, the Gnostics, for instance, whom he sought to confute by this mode of interpretation, might very conveniently use it for overthrowing the entire history of the life and death of Christ, the truth of which they denied. But I suspect that Origen became accustomed to this bold exegesis in the same school in which he learned philosophy. For those well informed on the subject know that all the disciples of Ammonius interpreted Homer, Hesiod, and the entire history of the pagan deities in the very same manner in which Origen taught his followers to interpret a large part of the Bible. He induced the expositors of Scripture to think little about the literal sense of passages and to run enthusiastically after the sublimer interpretations. It was very different with the other Christian doctors who possess good sense. Although they highly valued the mystical sense, yet they placed an equal value on the grammatical and historical. Nay, they made the latter the foundation and basis of the former, whence it would follow that no inquiry after the arcane and moral sense should be made until the literal meaning is carefully and accurately ascertained. And this is an important point, Lane, because when I see allegory, that's fine. I'm never discarding the original meaning, the original primary meaning, the historical event, the historical application is always the primary meaning. And if you see allegorical significance somewhere, it's always only a secondary meaning. And it can, it can only buttress a doctrine that's made clear elsewhere. You know, you can never use allegory to form doctrine and stuff. So, but that's even a different point. But Origen wanted to emphasize the spiritual discard, the primary meaning. That's what he wanted to do. And so the Jewish prophets wouldn't be prophesying of a glorious era for the nation anymore. They would be speaking of a wonderful spiritual era on earth instead. That's what he was shooting for. While hoping to keep a view that looks respectful to the Old Testament and at least convinces people that you have a high view of the Old Testament. It's really not a high view of the Old Testament though. It, well, you know, it's a terrible method of exposition. Um, all right. Origen sought to derive from the scriptures by means of allegories that philosophy which he had embraced and that he believed the philosophical grounds of the Christian doctrines were exhibited though somewhat obscurely, by the sacred writers. Those who, up to that time, had sought for allegories in the scriptures had found there only religious or sacred allegories, such as referred to Christ, 
to Antichrist, to the state of the church, and to the duties of Christians. But Origen, following the example of Philo, Judaeus, whom he was taught by his master, Clement, to follow as a guide, endeavored to make a large part of the Bible teach the dogmas of the philosophers. And here Mashim is hinting toward the third bird that Origen's trying to kill with his stone. He wants to bring this Christian faith into the big time, make it a full-blown Greek philosophy. Now, as all the opinions we have mentioned were displeasing to most Christian teachers, so the rules of interpretation introduced by Origen to advance them could not but displease many and be rejected not only as novel, but also as injurious to the scriptures and to their author. As to the causes which induced Origen to amplify and to systematize the allegoric mode of interpreting scripture, it must be admitted in the first place that much was due to the excessively fecund genius of the man, to the customary practice among the Egyptians, to his education, to the instruction of his preceptors, and to the example both of the philosophers whom he admired and of the Jews, especially Philo. But in addition to these external and natural causes, as they may be called, there were others originating from his own deliberate judgment, and among the latter some were not dishonorable or unworthy of a religious teacher desirous of advancing the cause of Christianity. And that's an important point there too, Lane. Even though I don't like origin, you have to understand when he was living and the mindset he was in and what he thought he was doing. And um, you can understand why he did what he did. And he's not this evil, satanic monster. Are you sure about that? He was doing what he did for reasons, you know. And... Uh, so you really have to look into it and think on it. But... I could definitely see why this guy was uh, not well liked or uh, overlooked based on some of the stuff he's saying. Yeah, he was a hero at first for about 150 years or 200 years. Not too long, though. And people started frowning on his method because you can make the Bible mean anything. It ends up being this very dangerous thing. I see. So. He thought he was saving the church, you know. I don't know. He thought he was correcting some errors which would actually make Christianity a real religion for the big time, you know? I don't know. Um... So, it's easy to demonize him, though. You read a lot of books where he's demonized. And um, he was, in his own sort of way, he, he was trying to help the church. Well, right, right. <laughs> 
I would say it's no help at all. It's no. All right. First, he hoped that the Jews would more readily be persuaded to embrace Christianity if certain portions of the Old Testament were explained mystically and allegorically. For he supposed certain prophecies which, if construed literally, would not refer to Christ, were an obstacle to the Jews embracing Christ. But that if these prophecies were explained mystically, and no regard paid to the literal sense, the Jews might be more ready to believe that all the ancient prophets foretold concerning the Messiah actually referred to Jesus of Nazareth. Secondly, he supposed that the class of heretics called Gnostics, the Basilidians, the Valentinians, and others could not be completely put down and confuted except by the admission of allegories in the Old Testament. For these sects, in order to prove that the Supreme God, the Father of our Savior, was a different being from him who created this world and caused the Old Testament to be written, cited many passages from the Mosaic Laws, from the writings of the prophets, and from the historical books of the Old Testament, which they considered as unworthy of the majesty and holiness of the Supreme God, and as indicative of a degree of weakness and wickedness. And as Origen despaired of solving these objections, he thought they must be avoided by resorting to allegories, and that all the passages with which the Gnostics reproached God and his friends and ministers must be construed in a mystical sense worthy of the divine character. These two reasons Origen himself repeatedly mentions, and especially in his book, De Principis. And Mashim goes on from here, really, to get into the third bird that Origen killed with his stone. He says he would like to introduce uh, uh, higher philosophical principles into the overall faith. So there's more to it than the quotes I have provided, but I wanted to get to this this reason here. Origen was the first to reject the material kingdom in a in a positive manner. He's the first to positively assert no earthly millennium uh, and so forth. He's the first so-called orthodox father to present these views. And I should do a follow-up video sometime where I read from Origen himself in De Principis, Book 4, Chapter 1. It's dedicated to his method of exposition, and he explains why he's doing it, and he gets right to spiritualizing the kingdom and teaching